Thank you to Blinkist for supporting PBS. More than 500 million years ago, a small plated animal not even an inch long sat on the seafloor of what's now Spain. It was kind of oval shaped and covered in upward pointing spines. Paleontologists named this little creature Tino imbricata, and it's one of the oldest echinoderms that we've found. This group includes animals like starfishes, brittle stars, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. And scientists know that it was an echinoderm based on the material that made up its internal skeleton, a calcium carbonate matrix called stereome, which is a feature shared by all of the members of this group. But today's adult echinoderms all share another special characteristic. They have radial symmetry, with a mouth at their center and their other body structures repeating around it in sets of five, like spokes on a wheel, yes, even sea cucumbers. Except Tino imbricata didn't have radial symmetry. It had right-left bilateral symmetry, like us, where the left half mirrors the right half and its mouth faced upward at one end of its body. So how did the ancient ancestors of starfish go from having bilateral symmetry to having radial symmetry? And how did the starfish get its arms? Well, it might have been caused by a series of changes in the environment that saw the ancestors of starfish adapt from living life face up to living it face down. The story of echinoderms might actually go back a little farther than Tino imbricata to a 555 million year old fossil found in Australia. It's named R. Karua, and it's an impression that shows what appears to be repeating sections around a central axis. But there's no evidence that it had stereome, the stuff that makes up the internal skeleton of all echinoderms, so it could have just been another round animal like a jellyfish or a sponge. This makes Tino imbricata one of the first for sure echinoderms. It had no arms and was a so-called basket feeder, taking water into and out of its upward facing mouth and filtering out suspended bits of organic stuff with a basket shaped structure. In contrast, most modern starfishes are active predators that use their chunky arms to explore the sea floor for food. Each arm can bend and curl thanks to supportive plates made of stereome and special connective tissues that can go soft or stiff. And rows of hydraulic tube feet found along canals on the underside of each arm help living starfishes move around and bring food to their mouths. So a starfish's arms are essential to its mobile seafloor cruising way of life. And yet the first echinoderms had no arms, not just Tino imbricata, but other species from the Cambrian period too. They were all bilaterally symmetrical basket feeders with their upward facing mouths positioned at one end of their bodies. The first radially symmetrical echinoderm known from the fossil record is Camptostroma, which shows up between 516 and 513 million years ago in Pennsylvania. It had the five-part symmetry common to all modern echinoderms, and Camptostroma was paving the way for the echinoderms we see today. It shared a common ancestor with a group called the Blastozoans, which evolved many variations on a body plan built around five repeating parts. They fed by filtering out suspended food from the water column and channeling it through upward facing feeding grooves to their mouths. But why did some echinoderms become radially symmetric and develop this new body plan in the first place? Why questions are tough to answer in paleontology, but it might be that basically an animal with bilateral symmetry is equipped to move in one direction, often leading with its head. If you're just gonna sit still, capture food and not move around, the radial body plan may help you better access food in 360 degrees. So okay, this body plan might have some advantages, but why five part radial symmetry specifically? Why not some other number? It's still an open question, but there's a hypothesis that five parts instead of any other number gives you the strongest possible arrangement of the plates that give structure to echinoderms. And how about arms, which showed up in some blastozoans? One of these groups called eocryonoids had a bunch of spaghetti-like feeding arms spreading out around an upward facing mouth. Eocryonoids first appeared in the fossil record roughly 517 million years ago. They became super common during the Cambrian, so something about their body plan was working. 
Early Cambrian eocrinoids stuck lightly to the sediment or just rested on it while suspension feeding. But by the late Cambrian, they attached to new harder substrates and some used root-like holdfasts. For example, Lycanoides buried part of itself in a burrow and may have used fibers made of collagen to anchor itself to the substrate. And it's that period of time called the Cambrian Substrate Revolution that may have driven them and other blastozoans to adapt. As burrowing animals evolved, the ocean bottom was becoming a lot softer, and water near the seafloor became more murky with sediment being churned up. Some eocrinoids like Gogaia developed stem-like stalks that raised their arms higher into the water column further from the sediment. Heading into the Ordovician period around 485 million years ago, eocrinoids diversified into thousands of forms. Sea levels were high then, and the area north of the equator was almost all ocean. There was an explosion of marine biodiversity of all kinds, including the similar looking and closely related group, the crinoids, also called sea lilies, which showed up and diversified into many species with different suspension feeding body types. Crinoids became the most abundant echinoderms of the Ordovician, and some were the ancestors of today's stockless feather stars and stocked sea lilies. If anything, the eocrinoids and crinoids with stalks were moving away from the low profile body plan of a starfish. So what happened? Where did the starfishes come from? Well, there's a fossil gap between the early stocked echinoderms and the forms that look like today's starfish. And a study published in early 2021 could provide some clues about what happened in the gap. It looks like some of the crinoids might have taken a different approach to feeding. Instead of staying face up suspension feeders, they went face down. A fossil found in Morocco and dated to 480 million years ago is the most primitive starfish-like animal known. And it kind of looked like a flipped over stalkless sea lily. Cantabrigiaster had the thick arms of a starfish, but like sea lilies, lacked small hard plates along the edges of its arms. And judging from the orientation of its arm canals and tube feet, Cantabrigiaster fed face down on the sediment. So the first starfish may have originated from a sea lily that face planted, putting its mouth down on the seafloor. And it might have been pressure to find a new feeding niche that drove this switch from face up to face down, since the Ordovician witnessed an explosion of suspension feeding, with lots of competition for floating bits of food. Plankton diversified, followed by a host of suspension feeders, like certain types of brachiopods, rugose corals, and bryozoans. The Ordovician period also saw the advent of more active suspension feeders, like the giant filter-feeding anomalocarid a gyrocassis. And while it's impossible to know why Cantabrigiaster developed its adaptations, its ecological niche of feeding on bits from the seafloor might have reduced competition with active filter feeders. It also may have opened up the possibility of using its tube feet for moving around. Modern starfishes move using their tube feet in a way that's similar to what crinoids do to waft food into their mouths. But we still need more fossil evidence to help us figure out whether Cantabrigiaster really was a transitional animal between crinoids and sea stars or not. Either way, the Paleozoic era continued to be dominated by the crinoids and other echinoderms. And once they developed their multi-armed, face-down body plan, starfish had a foot in the door. Or maybe an arm in the door? The Paleozoic came to a dramatic end about 252 million years ago with a mass extinction event. Research suggests that this dying off was caused by global warming and a serious decrease in the ability of ocean water to hold oxygen. Echinoderms were hit hard and whole groups went extinct. But starfish and their skinny armed cousins, the brittle stars, made it through, along with a few crinoids, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins, the groups we still see today. Paleontologists wonder whether the ability to move around might have helped starfishes fare better than the stationary crinoids did. Beginning about 240 million years ago and continuing through the late Triassic and Jurassic periods, starfishes diversified rapidly to become among the most common echinoderms, second only to the brittle stars. Today, starfishes and brittle stars are the most successful groups of echinoderms in terms of abundance, diversity, and geographic distribution. Together, they contain around 4,000 known species. And crinoids are still around too, but their species number in the 600s, in contrast to the 6,000 known species that have lived throughout Earth's history. 
So as odd as the starfish body plan seems, something about it was successful. From their ancient bilateral ancestors to the radial crinoids with their upward-facing arms to the predatory downward-facing starfish. And their arms play a whole range of roles, from feeding to sensing their environments, taking in oxygen, and housing some of their vital organs. The evolutionary past of starfishes from bilateral to radial animals is also echoed in their development. All modern echinoderms start their lives as swimming larvae with bilateral symmetry, and then settle down on the substrate to transform. The left side grows into five parts, while the right side gets absorbed, and we end up with an adult radial echinoderm. The story of how the starfish got its arms reminds us that even animals that might be familiar to us today can have incredibly deep histories, ones that stretch back almost a half a billion years. And their ancient ancestors wouldn't have seemed familiar to us at all. We'd like to thank Blinkist for supporting PBS. It can be hard to find the time to sit down and read a whole book, but now you can in the blink of an eye. Blinkist is an app that produces key takeaways from thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them into 15 minutes that you can either read or listen to. Blinkist has an array of categories to suit many interests, from nature and the environment to technology in the future. For more information and a Blinkist limited trial, please go to the link in the description. Now, be sure to check out our episode, How Plankton Created a Bizarre Giant of the Seas, to learn more about a gyrocassis. And thanks to this month's star eontologists, Sean Dennis, Jake Hart, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, and Patrick Seifert. Become an eonite at patreon.com slash eons to get fun perks, such as submitting a joke for us to read, like this one from Steph. Can a crappy dinosaur joke get a laugh? You bet your ass <laughs> Oh, if you didn't hear that punchline, it's uh, you bet your dress again. <laughs> I can't even get it out. Oh my God. That, mm, yep. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Constantine Haas' studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more evolutionary escapades.